Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Clifford Shannon, coming to you from my office this time rather than my secret lair uh, for the 9 11 Memorial Museum uh, and our continuing program exploration of the ramifications and impacts of 9 11, even now, 20 years later. Um, we have a really interesting program today, and um, there are some complications to it, so I warn you in advance. Uh, but it's um, something I think is really important to look at, and I'm very glad to be joined here um, by uh, Brett, Bruce Eagles, uh, Brett Eagleson, who lost his father, Bruce, in the collapse of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Bruce had spoken to his family to let them know that he had survived the impact of the planes and that he was coordinating efforts with the FDNY. Um, it's thought that he was going back to his office to get some two-way radios when the South Tower collapsed. Brett was 15 years old at the time, a sophomore in high school in Connecticut, and he has devoted much of his adult life as an advocate for accountability for the 9-11 community as to what happened on 9-11. Um, he did work with members of Congress on the passage of the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism, the so-called JASTA Act, and um, uh, that was passed uh, by Congress over President Obama's veto, and he has continued to work on these issues through the trial. Um, also joined today by uh, Ken Williams, who's a former police officer in the city of San Diego. Uh, then in uh, 1990, he became a special agent of the FBI assigned to Phoenix, where he started working on financial crimes, but moved quickly into international terrorism matters. And uh, he retired in May 2017, but he's a consultant and an investigator on this lawsuit. One of the interesting things about Ken's biography was that during his work for the FBI in Arizona, he came across what he describes as a pattern of activity involving Middle Eastern males with radical ideologies uh, who were involved in the study of aviation related subjects at various schools in Arizona. And as a result of his investigation, uh, he wrote uh, what became known as the Phoenix Memo about this phenomenon uh, for the Bureau in July of 2010. And we are joined as well, and welcome Ali Soufan. Um, Ali is the founder of the Soufan Center and the chief executive of the Soufan Group, which is a leading national security and counterterrorism agency. He is an expert, of course, in those fields. He was an FBI supervisory special agent investigating a number of international terrorism cases including the East Africa embassy bombings in 1998, the attack on the USS Cole in 2000, and the events surrounding 9-11. Uh, uh, he has written extensively about these issues, the author of Anatomy of Terror, From the Death of Bin Laden to the Rise of the Islamic State. Also, uh, a New York Times bestseller, The Black Banners, Inside Story, The Inside Story of 9-11 and the War Against Al-Qaeda which was subject in its original uh, edition to significant redactions and uh, more recently um, was released as a declassified version, the Black Banners, now called How Torture Derailed the War on Terror After 9-11. So thank you to all of you. Just a couple of notes for our audience. Um, if you need access to our captioning, just click on the link at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to submit a question, uh, you can do so via the chat bubble at the bottom of the screen on the right. And um, we will incorporate some of your questions into the conversation. Gentlemen, thank you again. Um, Brett, um, I want to start with you. Um, obviously, uh, your life as a teenager was turned upside down by this attack. But tell me about your involvement with this lawsuit, what motivated it, you're not alone among family members who have pushed for some kind of judicial outcome here, but it's clearly something that um, takes a lot of your time and your commitment into your adult years. Uh, how long have you been doing this kind of work and why are you doing it? Well, you know, first I have to give thanks to my wife and to my employer for allowing me to be able to do what I do. There's a lot of times when I can't be home or, um, can't be involved as much as I would like to be with our new daughter. She's 14 months old. So I owe a lot of praise to my wife, Stephanie, and to my employer who allows me to do this because it's very, you know, they agree that this is very important. 
And, uh, you know, in the days and months after 9-11, I was trying to do all the things a normal teenager would do. I tried to put my life back together. I, you know, focused on hanging out with friends, going to the movies, interested in sports, um, focusing on studying and getting into college. So I sort of just blocked 9-11 out of my life. I was from a rural area in Connecticut, so not many people around me uh, were affected by 9-11. But I never really bought the official narrative that 19 essentially cavemen with no knowledge of English, no money, no real knowledge of Western culture, uh, no knowledge of how to fly a plane, were able to band together and pull off one of the most consequential and devastating attacks on the United States history with no help from anybody. And that was the narrative that our government fed to us. And that's the narrative that our government would like us to believe because they want to sort of put 9-11 in a box and tie it up in a bow and put it on a shelf and, and, and be done with it. I mean, you're seeing that today with us pulling out of Afghanistan. You're seeing that today with them trying to close down Guantanamo Bay. And they want us to move on from that. However, I never really bought that narrative. And when I became aware of, of a pending lawsuit in 2016, it made total sense to me. And in 2016, there was an effort underway in Congress to create a law and pass it called the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act. And I, and I investigated that a little bit and I said, hmm, this seems interesting. I wonder what this is all about. And I had received a letter from one of our lawyers asking us to engage with members of Congress to support it. And I immediately said, finally, this is a way for us to continue the investigation and to search deeper and to find more truth, more than just bin Laden um, and more than just Al Qaeda, there was a support network in place. So I started off with a very modest goal. I started off in 2015, 2016-ish with reaching out to my local Connecticut U.S. House representative. And my initial goal was if I could get Rosa DeLora, who was my representative, to be a co-sponsor of this bill, then I will do something in my dad's name and I could kind of attach my name to this bill and be proud of the fact that my representative co-sponsored a piece of legislation that would allow us to bring a suit against the kingdom. Um, so I did that. It, it, it took three or four weeks, but finally Rosa and the team came on board and immediately a fire within me was lit to say, well, if I could get one, why can't I get others from Connecticut? So then I had the next goal of getting the entire Connecticut delegation on board. And sure enough, we kind of knocked them off one by one. We got every U.S. House member in, in Connecticut to co-sponsor this legislation. Well, uh, long story short, that caught the attention of some of the lawyers. They said, who the heck is this kid up in Connecticut? I was a kid, you know, I'm probably in my 20s at the time. And said, how did you get five co-sponsors? You know, tell us your secret because we want to replicate that um, through all the states. And then it got the attention of Senator Blumenthal. And I received a call from his office. And um, Senator Blumenthal, already on the Senate side, had been out there. He was one of the lead sponsors of JASTA. So ever since that day, I've been really involved with working with Congress, working with the senator working with other members, Rosa DeLora and others, working with former um, agents as well, just learning as much as I can and really pushing and advocating for truth and transparency. Because at the end of the day, that's all that we want is we want closure and we want truth. And, and this lawsuit is the way to do that because we're doing what our government really kind of failed to do. They never pursued any leads into 9-11. Uh, I, I should clarify, they didn't pursue a lot of the leads that were open-ended that that regarded Saudi Arabia's role. So it, it really does focus, uh, the lawsuit certainly does, is a civil action against Saudi Arabia for this material support that is allegedly provided to uh, the terrorists. Um, Ken, you were involved in investigations during your career and of course since in this regard. Um, there is this sense that the Bureau has not been entirely forthcoming. And in fact, uh, some of the Bureau's documents are being held under a protective order uh, that Attorney General Barr and the Trump administration issued and that so far anyway, the Biden administration has not uh, re revoked. So how can you assess the Bureau's stance in this since the materials that would presumably shed more light on what Saudi role there is behind the scenes in this those materials were the product of, of FBI work, and yet they're not being widely shared or acted upon. Well, you bring up a good point. I mean, to begin with, in the days, the hours, the days, weeks, and months following 
the FBI was given a, a huge challenge. I mean, our, our, our mission was to prevent the next attacks from happening in the United States. And I, I can assure you there were a lot of uh, disruptions, a lot of uh, uh, interrupted uh, attacks that were planned for the United States. So the Bureau in the initial stages of nine, after 9-11 didn't really have the time to go back and look, do some gun gumshoe detective work on the case like people, I think, believe took place. It wasn't until many years later that FBI New York and FBI San Diego initiated a case called Operation Encore, where they went back and they were able to look at, at different things, uh, namely uh, Saudi Arabian government officials' involvement with the hijackers. And uh, that's the material that is not being released to the plaintiffs and to the families here. And to me, it, it's it's unconscionable that it's not being released. I mean, what you have here, uh, uh, Cliff, is an unsolved murder investigation. I mean, since being involved with the plaintiff's attorneys after my retirement in 2017, I became aware of Operation Encore. I wasn't aware of it in sitting in Phoenix because we did not have much uh, connectivity with with Saudi Arabian government officials and and the two hijackers when they were in Arizona at the time, the Wafa Hazmi and Hani Hanjour. But since my retirement and reviewing the Operation Encore material with the plaintiffs' attorneys, uh, there's clearly, in my professional opinion, evidence of collusion between the government of Saudi Arabia and the hijackers. I can't get into the details because I'm under an FBI protective order that prevents me from doing that, which means if I overstep my bounds, they could seek prosecution against me. OK, but I can assure you that there's additional follow up that needs to be done. There's evidence out there that shows, in particular, three people, Omar al-Bayoumi, uh, Fahad al-Flamari and uh, Mossad al-Jara, uh, providing support to the two hijackers uh, when they entered in uh, through Los Angeles. So this is the material that is being uh, hidden from the plaintiffs. Uh, and uh, hidden from the public. And I think it's unconscionable. Uh, the government keeps asserting state secrets. Uh, my my question is, once state secrets are invoked uh, involving mass murder, there's something wrong with that whole procedure. It, it, mur mass murder should not be covered by state secrets. I mean, if that's, if and this is what my opinion is what's happening, that needs to be changed. I mean, you cannot have one murder, let alone the murder of thousands of people protected under state secrets. I mean, justice isn't being served. Lady Justice and the Scales of Justice, she wears a blindfold. And the reason why she wears a blindfold is because we take the evidence wherever it takes us, regardless of where it goes, the good, the bad, the ugly. I mean, and once we start allowing the Scales of Justice to lift up that blindfold, we're really undermining our whole found the whole judicial system's foundation, and we we can't we can't have that. And, and so this this is a bigger issue than just them giving, you know, us information. When I mean us, the plaintiffs' attorneys, uh, information to hold hold the Saudis accountable. It it, it it the bigger issue here is is the 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 rotting of our foundation of justice. It, you know, uh, I know Ali's written a lot about. Uh, you know, the enhanced interrogations and how that, that goes against our, our judicial system, too, and what I believe is an FBI agent. And here we got an extension of that type of stuff. And we, we need to stop that. And these people need to know what happened. And we need to hold the Saudi Arabian government accountable for their, their actions prior to 9-11. Ali, you were involved, as I mentioned before, in those critical pre-9-11 investigations. And of course, then the 9-11 investigation itself. and we know that 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi nationals. Um, from that early point, even leading as far as you can today, because as Ken indicates, there are protective orders around some of the materials, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, what was your sense of the Saudi trail of involvement through whether it's those two precursor attacks or the 9-11 attacks it's, uh, itself, or then uh, even after that? You're on mute, Holly. Hang on one second. We're, we're not hearing you. What about now? Is it better? There you go. Start again. Okay. So uh, good to see you, Clef. Hi, Brett and Ken. Yeah. My God, I didn't see you, I think, in the last 18 years, maybe? It's been a long, it's been a long time, my friend. Yeah. We both look very different at this point. Yes, we do. <laughs> we're denying that, folks. There's no change after 18 years. We're, um, that's a judicial so, ruling from me. So, um, you know, 
the Saudi Arabian involvement or connections to Saudi Arabia uh, literally existed in every single terrorism investigation we had uh, related to uh, Salafi jihadis or related to Osama bin Laden al-Qaeda network. Uh, for example, um, few of the people who were involved in uh, the East Africa embassy bombings in August of 1998 uh, were connected, there were Saudis. Uh, one of the suicide bombers in the East Africa embassy bombings uh, was a Saudi. Um, also, in the same time, actually two of them were Saudis. One survived, who's in jail now, and the other one died in the Nairobi bombing. Uh, the USS Cole, one of the suicide bombers, uh, was a Saudi. Uh, 9-11, as you mentioned, 15. Um, even uh, with ISIS, at one point early on, most of the suicide bombers that ISIS were using, um, some estimate at one point put it as high as 70%, were all from one country. Guess what it was? Saudi Arabia. Uh, when Baghdadi was killed, his deputy was killed the day after him. Uh, the deputy of ISIS, Abu Hassan al-Muhajir, was also a Saudi. I think he's uh, Shahri, his last name. Uh, um, so um, we always found connections, not only operational, but also logistical and financial. Um, many of the disruptions that we have 9-11 and can talk, can talk about some of them. Uh, the money came from some people in Saudi Arabia. Uh, a lot of the money that was used in different operations to include, frankly, we believe uh, the 9-11 itself. Uh, the person who was involved in the USS Cole investigation uh, confessed to me after in, I interrogated him in Yemen, his name was Fahd al Kusso, that he delivered $36,000 to Southeast Asia to give it to Khalad. A day or two after he gave the money to Khalad, who came to the meeting with Nawaf al Hazmi and Khalid Mehdar, they stayed in Bangkok in a hotel called the Washington Hotel, out of all names. They purchased uh, first-class tickets to uh, come to LAX airport. They were waiting for money that was delivered from Saudi Arabia to Yemen and moved via two couriers, one who told me the story and the second one who later became a suicide bomber in the USS call, were delivered to Khalad bin Atash in Bangkok. So we never looked into the connection with the government of Saudi Arabia, because frankly, some of the people who were dealing with in the government of Saudi Arabia, especially after 9-11, like Prince Mohammed bin Nayef and the folks in the Ministry of Interior were dedicated in the fight against Al-Qaeda. But there was always suspicion that others were sympathetic especially when it comes to money, and especially when it comes to logistical support. In so many different places around the world, not only in Afghanistan and not only in Africa, and not only in the Sahel and not only in Chechnya or Bosnia or Albania after the Bosnian war was over when everybody shifted down to Tirana, most of the operatives for Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Jihad network that was working closely with Al-Qaeda before they merged together took the cover of NGOs, non-government organizations, especially Islamic Relief organizations. Al-Haramain is one of them. Islamic Relief is another one. We did a few operations here in the United States to shut them down. And we found significant incriminating evidence when you're shutting down these agencies about Al-Qaeda. For example, uh, minutes of meetings about the establishment even of Al-Qaeda. Um, there was enough pressure on the Saudi government and frankly, enough fear in Saudi Arabia of what happened on 9-11 that they took actions against these organizations like Al-Haramain and they shut them down. Now with 9-11, it's interesting. We found a lot of Saudi connections, but at the time, as Ken was saying, you know, we were focusing on preventing the second attack. Um, after we were able to identify who were the people who were involved in the operation in general. And we able to uh, identify that the folks, the terrorists who were on the planes are actually Qaeda members. Uh, my job was focused on the stuff that Ken talked about, prevent the second attack. We had a different team uh, from Washington, actually, investigating the 9-11 attack from headquarters. 
So a lot of the things that we started to hear about after we left the job, um, you know, I agree with everything Ken said, uh, we did not know about when we were on the job working counterterrorism and working Al Qaeda. Uh, it is oh, interesting, for example, you? that even the 9-11 Commission... Ali, just one minute. I have a, a question. Someone wants us uh, just to uh, detail. Bill asks, the money you referred to before, what form did it take? Was it cash? Was it $100 bills? I mean, what was actually physically being passed around? Cash. Cash. $36,000. If you're talking about the 9-11 stuff, it was $36,000 uh, taken... Uh, was sent from, Yemen, from Saudi Arabia to Yemen. Two people in Yemen received the money. One is named Fahd al Kuso, and the other is named Ibrahim al Thawr. Ibrahim al Thawr was later killed because he was one of the suicide bombers on the USS Cole. And then their job in uh, early January of uh, January 1st, I think, or January 3rd of 2000, uh, was to deliver the money to Southeast Asia. The reason Al-Qaeda sent two operatives is because they were worried if one of them gets stopped at the airport, they have more money than the threshold permit. So they divided it among two okay. people. Khalad received the money. And the next day, two tickets were, bank, were purchased in Bangkok in cash to LAX. One ticket was to Khalid uh, Dar. So Understood. now the number... Even the 9-11 Commission, I think they made it clear that we don't know what happened in the first, you know, couple of days or even couple of weeks after the hijackers, the, the, the future hijackers, Mehdar and Hazemi, arrived to LAX. Now we're reading, because of the great work of somebody like Brett and the lawyers, we know that they were actually put in an apartment that was sponsored by people like Thumeiri and like Bayumi. That's very incriminating and that's very significant. How did these two individuals, who later we found out that are officials in Saudi Arabia, knew about Khaled Mehdar and Nawaf Hazemi coming to the United States so they can receive them at the airport and they can provide them with housing um, in the first couple of weeks? Now, a lot of these things, you know, if I knew about it when I, when I was in the FBI, I'll be like, wow, this is significant. If Ken knew about it when he was in, I'm sure he will write about four memos about it, not one like the other one. I mean, it is not the Phoenix memo. There will be Phoenix memo one, two, three, and four. Um, this is significant. Unfortunately, we did not know about it until the families start to work. And this is when exactly what happened with, uh, with Brett, you know, the fire went inside us. Like, what's going on here? Well, let me pick it up. Let me pick it up with Brett. Let me pick it up with Brett because, you know, there are really um, great restrictions on the access to the results of various depositions and documents, U.S. government documents, as a result of this trial. So whereas your lawyers know certain things that are involved here, they are under a seal or under an order that they cannot share them with their clients. So take us through the more recent events, because if I'm understanding correctly, there have been 24 depositions of Saudi officials, including some of the men that Ali Sufan just mentioned, but in Saudi Arabia as part of the trial. There are also American documents reflecting FBI and CIA investigations into these matters that may have been shared, I believe, with your attorneys, but have not been shared more broadly with the plaintiffs to the case. So these are very, very unusual conditions under which a case can be pursued. And what I, I imagine, um, well, I, I imagine it's difficult, but do you think it actually is going to affect the outcome of the case that if these things remain sequestered, there will be no public knowledge of them. And that lack of public knowledge may remove a lack of pressure on whatever logical conclusions one might draw from this information. That's one of the major travesties here, is that the most significant lawsuit, in my opinion, that's ever been conducted in the United States history is shrouded in secrecy. The government is forcing the hand. The government is forcing our lawyers to sign FBI protective orders. So the people that deserve the information the most, those that are most directly affected by 9-11, like myself, 
and thousands of others who lost a parent, who lost a husband, a wife, a brother, sister, they can't even see the information. We can't talk to our lawyers about, hey, how did that deposition go or, or what's going on? What did he say? And I know that it's so hurtful to our lawyers, but it's also hurtful to us. So what our government is doing is egregious. They're rubbing salt on an open wound. Our government failed us 20 years ago to prevent 9-11 from happening. And now they're failing us again today by imposing gag orders on our attorneys. So there's no such thing as closure for us. There's two sets of documents, um, Cliff. There are the documents that our lawyers have that are under sworn, that are under secrecy. But then there's even another set of documents, which our government won't even give to the lawyers. So really, you're talking about two levels of secrecy. One, uh, that the government deems is appropriate enough to give to the lawyers who have signed um, gag orders. But then two, documents such as the Operation Encore report, the 2016 summary report, or even the full version of the 2012 Operation Encore summary report. Our government has gone to such great lengths as invoking the state secrets privilege on that. Um, So... Uh, you know, and then another point I'd like to make is that the two, the 9-11 commission ended in 2004. So uh, the commission and the commissioners have always said this was never intended to be an exoneration of the Saudi role. We were underfunded. We lacked resources. We couldn't pursue every lead. We were rushed. So in 2004, they came out with this sort of half-baked report. And then you have Operation Encore, which starts two years later and proceeds for the next 10 years. So uh, the 9-11 Commission never had the luxury of looking at the results of a 10-year-long FBI investigation. So when you hear in the news or when you hear the Saudis say, oh, like the 9-11 Commission report, there was no there there. Well, the 9-11 Commission report, in my opinion, is null and void because the 9-11 Commission report um, wasn't acting on all the knowledge or all the information that, that, that was available. Had the findings of the 9-11 Commission report had the luxury of understanding what Encore was about or looking at the results of Encore, I think the outcome would be a lot different. Let me ask Ken, um, two aspects of this. We've spoken before and you said that in your experience, the idea that these FBI documents would be held under protective order was unprecedented actually in your experience. Your work at the Bureau continued in these post 9-11 commission years going forward. how different, and uh, you may be under uh, limits as to what you can say, but how different is the state of knowledge about the Saudi role in 9-11 compared to when the commission ended in 2004, and then as a result of subsequent investigations, um, how much was developed that is relevant to answering this, the, the questions posed by the lawsuit? Tremendous difference. I mean, uh, like Brett pointed out, the commission ended their investigation in 2004. Encore started in 2006 and was terminated in 2016. During those 10 years, agents in both New York and in San Diego developed a tremendous amount of information that clearly shows the complicity of employees of the government of Saudi Arabia's involvement with the two hijackers when they initially entered into the United States, Khalid al Madhar and Nawaf al Hazmi. I mean, like Ali pointed out, you know, we have this quote unquote chance encounter between Omar al Bayoumi, an employee of the government of Saudi Arabia. He worked for a company called Urkan, uh, who was a subsidiary of uh, Dalla Avco, a Saudi Arabian company that uh, uh, works with their Ministry of Defense in the aviation community. We have him meet these two guys in Los Angeles. He invites them down to San Diego, ostensibly because they didn't like the environment in Los Angeles. When they get to San Diego, he hooks them up with a young guy, you know, uh, Modar Abdullah, you know, a guy that's similar in age that acquaints them himself with these two guys, escorts them around the city, helps them get identifications, you know, introduces them to other members of the community. So it makes sense. Here you got a 42 year old man who initially meets these guys in Los Angeles, brings them down, invites them to San Diego. And then, you know, to make it easier for the two hijackers, he introduces them to this young guy, a guy that's similar in age, and and, and they hit it off. And, and and he gets them around and gets them IDs, you know, and, and gives them that type of support. So that's just that's just what I can talk about. I mean, the other things that I've seen from information, tranches of, of documents that we've gotten from the FBI pursuant to subpoenas are all protected under the protective order. But I can assure you, that the stuff that I've uh, have viewed with other retired agents that are consultants and investigators for the for the lawyers, 
there's a tremendous amount of information that goes there that would not only suffice the civil suit, which remember on the civil side of the house, there's a preponderance of the evidence where on the criminal side of the house, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. So I'm focused in helping the lawyers here, just showing the preponderance of the evidence. What, what would a reasonable person think of when they look at the actions of just Omar al-Bayoumi, for instance? You're going to say, hey, this guy was up... <laughs> This was not just a chance encounter. This guy went out of his way and helped them out by hooking them up with another younger person that facilitated the acquisition of things that were useful for them when they were in the United States. So that's just that's just one guy. I mean, so the other the other individuals, Fahad al Thumari and, and Musad al Jara, who are also government employees for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, namely with the Ministry of Islamic Affairs, accredited diplomats in the United States. We're also affiliated with them. So that's on the that's on the civil side of the house. Remember, the preponderance of the evidence. I can assure you, Cliff, that I could walk into to Director's Ray office today and give him off the top of my head at least six things that he needs to have his agents look at again, perhaps convene a grand jury on the criminal side of the house and seek indictments on people. Nobody's paid the price for, for this. I mean, this case has languished on the vine. The Bureau has seemed to have walked away, like Brett said earlier, packaged it in a box and let's move forward. You know, let's 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 forget about this. And I can assure you, there's no police agency in this country. Do you think the NYPD would not want to bite off on this right now and, and pursue a murder investigation on this? I can assure you they would. And the FBI should be leading the charge on that with the NYPD and, and other police agencies to, to hold people accountable. It, for, for me, it's it, it just it, it flies in the face of everything that I've ever believed in as a law enforcement officer and as an FBI agent, you know, that that we are not pursuing justice. We're not pursuing every lead. Having worked in the Oklahoma City bombing case back in 95, I can assure you the littlest things that we came across, we we attacked with vigor. And we, we went after it. Here, there are glaring things that we're just ignoring for one reason or another. You know, and, and, and that's what I'm saying. When, when, when the government hides behind the guise of state, when they invoke the privilege of state secrets, I mean, that privilege needs to be looked at. It needs to be looked at very hard because there's no way that it should cover mass murder. Yeah. And I just wanted to jump in real quick and just follow up on something that Ken said. You would think that the FBI and the federal government would be chomping at the bit to help us. Here we are doing finding all these leads. You would think that there would be just an enormous amount of cooperation. And the reality is, Cliff, is that it's the exact opposite. The FBI and CIA are sending in camera ex parte briefings to the judge. They are they are they are uh, negating the work of their own agents. They are they are trying to whitewash any sort of roles, and they're trying to conduct this in complete secrecy and hope that we give up and we move on. So the FBI and the DOJ are actually actively working against us where common logic or common sense would, would one would think that they would be chomping up the bit to help us. And, you know, it's just, and maybe Ali or Ken will know the answer to this, but, you know, what is the reason for the secrecy? There is no justification for the secrecy. Well, let me, let me ask um, Ali first, uh, you know, this whole issue of, the JASTA law was actually a way of narrowing the sovereign immunity claims that any foreign government can make being sued in a, in a different country. And there's a long history of that and tradition of this, and there's a real reason for sovereign immunity existing. But, you know, this was narrowed because of the pressure in relation to the possibility of Saudi complicity in this 9-11 attack. So, Ali, let's sort of step back and this may be speculative, but I think Brett asks the question that is critical to this. Why is this so difficult, do you think, to pursue in sort of the normal course of what a trial on another subject matter would pursue? Well, sometimes when things become classified, it is very difficult to unclassify them, regardless to why these things were classified on the first place or why people classified them in the first place. You mentioned about small little thing in national security, which is not as significant as what we were talking about my book. And it took more than nine years to unredact stuff that is part of it is actually in the public domain. I think my fear in this situation, and I don't have any inside information about why the DOJ or the FBI is working the way they are working. I think somebody, as Ken said, you know, and Brett, put that thing in a package and they finalize this investigation because we're focusing on something else. There is um, 
some kind of a summary, talking points, and these talking points have been repeated by these institutions, by these bureaucracies, and nobody is going to open the files and investigate what's going on. You know, nobody is walking to the director's office, uh, like Ken said, and he's like, look, you know what? We need to reopen this investigation. Nobody is going to an AUSA in the Southern District of New York or the Eastern District of Virginia and saying there is a lot of new information that's coming up that maybe we should convene um, 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 a grand jury. Uh, this is not how, Ken can tell you, this is not how the government functions. <laughs> this is how people, people don't go to look for work. <laughs> and especially if everything is classified, I, I face that and it's something totally different with, with the torture stuff. We have the facts, but there is a classified talking points that people were looking at. So they were supporting without providing any evidence against what we were saying. And it took literally the Senate Select Committee of Investigation, the Armed Services Committee. Uh, it took numerous investigations by the CIA IG, by the FBI IG, by all these individuals in order to start going beyond these talking points that people are repeating in different administrations, different institutions without opening the real files and checking the facts. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think that's what's happening in this case. And I think that's why it's extremely important for all these agencies to realize that transparency is essential in this. Because without a transparency, we're going to have conspiracies. We're going to have misunderstandings. We're going to have a bigger problem than they think. Uh, uh, the lack of uh, the lack of transparencies and classification is going to give them. And the biggest proof is the actions of people like Brett and the action of people like Ken and the actions of the families. It's the biggest proof of what they saw was just that. If they were uh, very open from the beginning and they followed every lead from the beginning, the government of Saudi Arabia, the current government of Saudi Arabia, won't be in the same corner that they are in today. So where is the end? This is America. Yes, I understand that sometimes it's essential to protect classified information because of sources, methods, you know, and, and other things. But you don't protect this kind of information that can tell you who's involved in the murder of 3,000 Americans, right? This is, this is, we're in a democracy. We're not China or Cuba or Iran for the government to do something like this. Can, and that's why I think we're going to continue, um, you know, supporting uh, people like the people who are doing these things. And I will personally continue to, um, you know, support people like Brad and others in, in their endeavor of what they are doing, because towards the end, we just want to know the truth. We're not trying to blame anyone. We want to know the truth. We had an investigation. Let me, let me, tell let, us. Let, me, let me just let me interrupt, because I, I, there's a point you made that I want to take to Ken. You know, uh, Ali's making an argument that that essentially bureaucratic inertia is often what rules the day in these kinds of cases. Um, is it your view that that's a factor here? Are there other things that uh, you suspect could be involved in terms of why these things are being held back the way they have? Yeah, d d inertia definitely plays a part. I agree with what Ali says there. There are other things, and, and you know, we could speculate all day, and 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 we do speculate on reasons why. They want to keep things classified at the highest levels and invoke state secrecy. But I don't like to dabble in that world because I want to dabble in the facts as I know them that I have in front of me that I've read that are already in FBI documents that I can't share because of the protective order, as well as just re as recently as this week, I conducted an interview of a witness that had significant information that this person provided to the FBI 20 years ago. And we're just getting that information. When I say we, the plaintiff's attorneys are just getting this information. So the FBI has not released even that information to us. Very basic information, but goes to proving the complicity of Saudi Arabia's involvement with the hijackers. And that information was not given to the FBI or was not given to the plaintiff's uh, attorneys uh, you know, through the subpoena process. And you have to ask the reason why. I can guarantee you, Given my example earlier, like we and the FBI need, leaves no stone unturned. Ali will tell you this. When you're working an investigation as big as this, any bit of information that comes in will be, you know, 
and especially the type of stuff that I'm referring to now that I can't share with you or your audience, uh, there would be no uh, limits on how the FBI would pursue this information. So I'm convinced that the FBI pursued this information. They identified the information and where it led them, you know, uh, they just don't want people to know. OK, because it, w- it was damning, in my opinion, towards the government of Saudi Arabia. A- and uh, uh, and again, we just developed this information this week, but it was in the government's hand 20 years ago. And, and the person that I interviewed, the person was astounded that their information has not been part of the public debate, has was not included in the 9-11 Commission report and uh, has just disappeared. You know, this is a credible witness. Uh, uh, who provided very important information. So, so that would lead to the stuff that is speculation, you know, uh, uh, about maybe something that went wrong in the intelligence community. Maybe something was happening. We were trying to do good and things got away from us and things went haywire, you know, but that's speculation. And again, in this thing, I'm, I'm, I'm just wanting to deal with the facts. The facts as I are presented to me. Uh, I don't like to get into this speculative arena uh, because that's, that's not my function. My, my, my function is to look at the facts. Let me, yeah, I, I, uh, let me just do something. Uh, I, I agree with everything can uh, said. Definitely. We, we come from the same school. Um, I think we need to keep in mind that the people who did Operation Encore for 10 years were the FBI. It is not FBI agents in New York and San Diego. They need budget. They need travel budget. They need support. They need supervisors. It's the whole FBI who are doing this. But towards the end in the government, especially when you're doing national security investigations, especially when you're doing national security investigation that have international dimensions, and when it comes to an impact that your investigation might have on countries that's considered allied countries and you need them in something else, that is not the FBI decision to put this information out. The FBI is not a country by itself. Towards the end, it operates within the, interne- the, the intelligence community and they operate basically within the um, overall strategic interests of the United States. So I, I kind of like sometimes, frankly, annoyed me when people start saying FBI agents in New York or in Phoenix or in San Diego doing this, but the FBI headquarters are against it. I think without FBI headquarters approval, they won't be able to function for 10 years and doing this. That means that there are people in the FBI leadership who basically believed that this is not a waste of time. They basically believe that we need to follow all these leads. Now, towards the end, who put the kibosh on the whole thing? That they cannot go to criminal grand jury? I can guarantee you it is not only the FBI. Let's put it this way. And most probably, it is not the FBI period. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's that. a. I think that's a very fair point. It, it sets up something that I wanted to ask you, Brett. As you know, over the course of many investigations in all the years since 9/11, there have been tensions between the families and the various administrations. Whether it's President Bush, President Obama, President Trump, whose Attorney General was the one who imposed the secrecy order on these documents, and now about uh, complaints about President Biden and his unwillingness to act, at least in the view of some families, on what was committed during the campaign to be much more open with the handling of these documents. Let me um, just quote briefly a a, a US Today op-ed from Terry Strato, whose husband Tom was killed in the North Tower on 9-11 and who has been a leader in this fight. She wrote, Uh, She writes, it's reprehensible that nearly 20 years after the brutal attack on our country, our federal government continues to prioritize its relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia over justice for Americans. The FBI and CIA agree that Al Qaeda had, quote, infiltrated and exploited the Saudi government before 9-11. And yet she argues uh, this is not something that the U.S. government is willing to allow to go public. So where does this stand now in relation to uh, President Biden's recent promise to look more closely and more expeditiously at the potential release of some of this equipment, uh, some of this material. Uh, Where is this standing as of today, just a few weeks from the 20th anniversary day? You're on mute. Before I answer that question, I think Ali made a good point, which I would like to clarify. Um, The vast majority of FBI agents, 
are good, great, patriotic Americans, and they are the best of the best, and they're the best in the world. So don't, I, I hope that no one ever interprets us to be out against the FBI or the, the agents because the vast majority of them are good, upstanding, great agents. It's the leadership and the bureaucracy is that's, that's, that's sort of our enemy. So, so I wanted to just state for the record, I didn't want to come across as if I was um, in any way suggesting that the agents themselves are bad. Um, most agents are all good. I mean, I'm standing with two of the best in the world right now. Um, so, but to answer your question, if, if you look at what President Biden said, um, and we, we are, um, are thankful that the president at least acknowledged that he made a campaign promise to us in October of 2020, uh, when President Biden was on the campaign trail, he had written a letter to our representatives saying that if he was lucky enough to be elected president, he would direct his attorney general to err on the side of disclosure versus non-disclosure. He said that the 9-11 families were right and just to pursue the truth. He supported our efforts and he actually thanked us. He said, you, you are doing good work, keep going, I support you. Then when he becomes president, it seems as if that statement has changed. And uh, we have not heard from his administration in nine months. We have done everything possible. We have written hundreds of letters. We have had members of the United States Senate reach out to the administration. We have done media. We have had made phone calls. We have pressured his administration officials with members of Congress. So for example, when Director Ray came to the FBI, he was questioned when Attorney General Garland um, I, I, sorry, when Director Ray came to the Hill, he was questioned by members of Congress. When Attorney General Garland came to the Hill, he was questioned by members of Congress. So you have all of Biden's administrative officials, all this, these cabinet levels and these director levels, they're getting questioned by our allies on the Hill. And this message clearly is getting back to the president. So we have this silence from the administration and the silence has been deafening. And what we're asking for is we're asking for a president to finally have the courage to do what three previous administrations before him didn't have the courage to do. And that is stand with the families, take our side, value the interests of the 9-11 victims of Americans over any interests, foreign interests, uh, interest of any foreign government. So uh, we, we, are, we are pleading to the Obama, to, to the Biden administration rather, to, to finally, once and for all, do the right thing, take our side, actively engage. And the reason why I say actively engage is because if you look at what President Biden said in his statement from the official White House statement, he said that we applaud the recent DOJ's filing in court. So then you look at the recent DOJ's filing in court, and it's a letter addressed to all parties involved. And all the DOJ committed to doing was review what they cannot and cannot give us. So it was empty promises. We that that statement flies in the face of why we're so upset to begin with. You need to understand that for 20 years we've been made false promises. We've been giving false assurances. One from a sitting United States president that our documents are coming. Your long lost uh, journey is coming to an end. Finally, you're going to get the closure you 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 so justly deserve. We stand with you. We feel for you. And every 9/11, you see the same thing happen. The president of the United States, political leaders, they come to ground zero or they go to these 9-11 remembrance ceremonies and they talk about how significant 9-11 is and how important that day is and how we should never forget and how they grieve for the families and how these families need to be honored. But if you really want to honor us, if you really want to support us, you would give us closure. You would actively engage. You wouldn't give us more empty words and, 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 and more false promises you would engage with us to see how we could work a way to get these documents out. Keep your sources and methods. We don't want your sources and methods. Protect the sources, protect the methods. From what I understand, there are no longer sources and methods. But give us the documents that we need to be successful to bring closure for the families. And, 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 and that's our position. We would love to have President Biden stand with us at the memorial where he's on our side, not where he's working against us. Let me ask, I have a couple of questions now coming in from our audience, family members. Uh, this is Ken. Um, Fred Brewer asks, do we as 9-11 family members need this encore documentation to win the civil case, do you think? Um, you know, you indicate that the preponderance of evidence does support a finding against the Saudis. There are depositions that have been taken, as we've discussed, 
does this have to be revealed or does this have to be counted? And if it is, do you think it will be a successful outcome for the trial? Well, I think that would be a better question asked of the attorneys, the litigators that are actually in the courtroom handling this. But I think we do need the documents. Yes, I think that would support uh, other things that we're developing independent of the actual documents that, you know, we're, we're out there actively investigating and, 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 and re-interviewing witnesses that the FBI interviewed 20 years ago, you know. Uh, so, yes, it would help us. Uh, it would support the stuff that we've gotten you know, as investigators for the, the lawyers, and it would just reinforce things that we're getting, plus things that we haven't even seen yet. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that we've not even seen. So yes, it would help us. I think you would have to ask the attorney, uh, the attorneys, the question as to whether or not it is uh, it is uh, the defining moment, if, it, if it's a game breaker. Uh, you know, uh, of course, I think it's very significant, and I think we, we do need them. Uh, and, and, and I'll just, I'll weigh in on that one too, Cliff. Um, I think that uh, even the threat of these documents being made public, um, fortunately or not fortunately, this lawsuit would probably be wrapped up a lot quicker than anybody thinks. I think that if the Saudis knew that they no longer had an ally, and if the Saudis knew even the threat of these documents coming out, I think they would try to move as fast as they could to resolve this before it ever got to a trial. Well, and, and to add to what Brett's saying, I mean, just the sheer fact that they're still being held from the plaintiff's attorney should tell your the viewers here that that it, it's there it's there i mean the saudis are afraid of what's in that information the u.s government doesn't want to release the information on the saudis and their documents so the fact that they continue to hold them secret and not share them i think is the answer to the question it's there the answer is there let's it, it, i have a relevant question in this regard from marty who says he's been to several of the southern district hearings and was curious to see plaintiff's counsel on one side and U.S. attorneys sort of sitting with the uh, Saudi attorneys. I mean, is this just coincidence or, you know, is there a greater sympathy uh, on that sort of relationship than in relation to the family case? I realize the U.S. government is the antagonist in the court uh, against the family's case. Well, um, being a family member who's witnessed that and saw that happening, I'll tell you, I don't know. I hope it, it was a coincidence. It was disheartening and disgusting to see. But even further than standing with them, how about them chatting in the hall and slapping each other's backs after the fact? Um, you know, they, they, they really made no effort to uh, cover up whatever alliance there is. And, you know, I think that brings a bigger question is, you know, and, and, and maybe this is for a story for another day. But, you know, how do these attorneys sleep at night that represent the kingdom? I mean, it, you know, they're making millions of dollars and these lobbyists are just taking this dirty blood money. And I think that the Saudi attorneys know that their clients are guilty or they have blood on their hands. So, you know, I think that's another story for another day. But um, yeah, I, I, I feel for you, Marty. I, I've been there and seen it. Well, let me add, and this is just a statement from a family member, which I just wanted to read in this context from Mark Rio. It's extremely disappointing and hurtful that our own government is not fighting as hard as they can for all the 9-11 families. This is the bigger, biggest murder case in the history of our country. Why is this happening? My family suffers every single day. It just doesn't go away like our government wants it to. We can handle the truth. And I think uh, all of you have said in one form or another something very similar. But I, I do want to change. We have uh, just a short amount of time left. I want to change gears a couple of times before we finish. It's impossible to look at what's going on in Afghanistan today and not think about Afghanistan before 9-11. Um, Ali, let me ask you, because you've been involved so much on the international side of these investigations, uh, what ramifications, if any, do you think events currently in Afghanistan have not only for this trial, which is a separate matter, but really for the kind of threat uh, that 9-11 represents and the groups that were involved in 9-11, are they making uh, or possibly making a comeback uh, in Afghanistan under the new version of the Taliban. Yeah, I mean, look, it seems to us that we went the full circle and we're back uh, where we started. Uh, but this time it's a little bit worse. It's a lot worse because at the time when 9-11 happened, we swiftly responded and we attacked and destroyed the Taliban regime as it existed at the time and Al-Qaeda network. But now, Al uh, now the Taliban won. And the people who did 9-11, Al-Qaeda network are in alliance with the Taliban. Remember, Al-Qaeda leaders gave an oath of allegiance to the Taliban. 
9-11 was an event that changed the world. We went to Afghanistan, we invaded Afghanistan because we cannot retaliate to the, 30, uh, to the 3,000 Americans and more who were murdered that day and some continue to die now because of events related to, to 9-11. Um, now, the Taliban are back in power. Al-Qaeda, uh, a lot of, um, I hear experts saying Al-Qaeda will return to Afghanistan. Uh, I think Al-Qaeda never left Afghanistan to return to Afghanistan. They continue to be there. And I think the situation now will be a situation where everything that happens in Afghanistan, we kind of look the other way, but what are we going to do? Invade again, spend $2 trillion again, spend there 20 years again. So Al-Qaeda and the Taliban think that this is a huge victory that's happening around the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Look, 9-11 changed the world, uh, literally, uh, on every level. Uh, our lives are very different because 9-11. Uh, the way we traveled is different before 9-11 than after 9-11. Uh, we invaded two countries. Uh, we were engaged in uh, catastrophic uh, you know, operations across the Middle East, uh, where we actually lost almost each and every one of them. Before 9-11, we had embassies in Libya. We had embassies in Sana'a. We had embassies in Syria. Now we don't. The U.S. is almost non-existent. In Iraq, after trillions of dollars, every day the Iranians you know, launch a couple of missiles next to our bases and next to our embassy to remind us who's the boss over there. In, um, in Kabul, we don't even have an embassy. We're operating inside the airport and trying to figure out how to get everybody out. Um, so we're losing in a lot of these catastrophic events. And a lot of people blame that oh, our engagement is because of what we did in 9-11. Let's start, before we start talking about these things, about what happened on 9-11, about giving the truth, and then we build upon that. Because if, frankly, you don't hide a nothing burger. You don't hide a nothing burger. So let's do it right. Let's investigate. Let's see what's going on here. And let's engage with the world where we know ourselves and we know our enemy. Let's engage with the world based on our values. And the number one thing in our value is truth and justice. So if we're, we're going to engage just for the sake of power, unfortunately, what happened in Afghanistan is going to happen in a lot of other places. And that will usher not only um, the defeat in Afghanistan 20 years after 9-11, but that will usher a new world order where the United States is no longer the leader. Because what manifested in Afghanistan today is just the latest of a lot of catastrophic, catastrophic uh, engagement that we have, uh, that's happening across the Muslim world. Look at the world now. Look at the Muslim world all the way from a Sahel region through Libya, through Yemen, Somalia, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, all these countries, the United States cannot operate in at this point. Let me, uh, Ken, did you want to add something on the Afghan situation in relation to all? Uh, yes, it's just very disheartening. Uh, like Ali said, we, we've handed the Taliban and Al-Qaeda a victory on the eve of the 20th anniversary of September 11th. I think the stand-up thing for the current administration to do is to order to release the documents to help us in our civil litigation against the Saudi Arabian government. Let's find out the truth of what happened and let's put this cha that chapter behind us while we're facing the next chapter, which is additional attacks emanating from Afghanistan and emanating from Al Qaeda. I mean, uh, let's, put, let's put yesterday behind us by doing the right thing by the victims and for the whole American public, because we're going to war again with these guys. They're not going away. Uh they I mean, believe they won. They believe they won 20 years, 20 years later. Yep. Right. They last, believe what Mullah, last, Mullah Omar said on the eve of 9-11, Bush promised us defeat, God, us, God promised us victory, who are you going to believe? They believe that he was accurate and he was right. Yep. yep. Brett, last one for you, and it comes from John Terry, who's asking whether uh, you expect that justice will be done here or that it'll be swept under the rug. We're going to fight like hell to make sure that justice is done. And the message is that we're not going anywhere. I think uh, those in the administration or those in the FBI or DOJ that want to see us go away just because the 20th anniversary happens 
doesn't mean we're going anywhere. My daughter was just born. She's 14 months old. She's going to learn. My nieces and nephews, they're going to learn. The second and third generations are coming up through the ranks. So um, I'm hopeful that justice will be done, and I'm hopeful that it's soon, and I'm hopeful that Biden recognizes the historic opportunity that he has to do that because it'd be such a political win for him. Um, but even if he doesn't, and even if it doesn't happen, just rest assured that we will continue fighting. And one final point I wanted to make, and I know we're kind of running on short on time here, is, is that if you're Saudi Arabia, and if you have a clean conscience, wouldn't you be advocating for all these documents to come out? Wouldn't the Saudis say, expose Encore, let's get to the bottom of this. If we're standing accused of doing it, if you had a clear conscience, you would see them calling for the declassification of all this, and you don't. And what does that mean? Thank you, Brett, uh, Ali, and Ken. Uh, just a final word or request. You know, um, with these programs at the end, I've sort of taken in recent times to asking you to consider supporting the museum. It's always a great idea if you are not a member, would like to become a member. That's a great way to support us. I do want to bring to your attention a new campaign that we are raising, the Never Forget Fund, which is uh, for the 20th anniversary, which is intended to support the education programs like this one that the museum runs for the general public, for school groups, for kids really around the world. And which, because it's 20 years, because there is a new generation like Brett's daughter and more, uh, they don't have the memory of this event. And we have to find ways to make sure that it's taught in its true and correct form. Because as we unfortunately still see, there are all kinds of distorted versions about what happened out there. So I'd ask you to consider that by going to neverforget.com. With that, I want to thank Ken Williams, Ali Sufan, Brett Eagleson for the 9-11 Memorial Museum. I'm Clifford Shannon. Thank you.